and welcome everyone. My name is Rita Kutsudimos and I'm the Executive Director of the BC Alliance for Healthy Living. We're so pleased that you're joining us today for our webinar, Come On and Join the Local Motion, Learning from Five Diverse Active Community Projects. Um, first, I'd like to acknowledge that we, are, we have the privilege to live, play, and work on the traditional territories of many First Nations across uh, across this land that we now call British Columbia, as well as other names. And here at BCAHL, we're thankful um, to join you from the traditional territories of the Squamish, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh. <laughs> so today we're going to talk about active communities projects that have been taking, across, taking place across the province for over a year now as part of the physical activity strategy. We have an interesting program lined up for you, which I'll tell you about shortly. But before we get rolling, I'll go over a few housekeeping items. If you're having trouble hearing us, try turning up the volume on your phone or computer. And we really want to get your input today. So we'll be asked to use the control panel on the right-hand corner of your screen to type in your questions for our speakers as you think of them. When we get to uh, the end of each presentation section, we'll, we'll go through some of those questions and just keep them coming because we like to have that, um, that question and, and answer period to get the most out of the session. We also want you to participate in some polls. We'll give you a heads up that the poll is coming and you'll see a blue screen that has multiple choice questions. Please respond to the polls. You'll have a few seconds to do so, and then we'll publish the results for everyone to see. The polls provide us, our panelists, and you with instant feedback. Again, we really want to hear your questions and comments. You can submit them at any time during a presentation by simply typing them in the question box on the right-hand side of your screen. Please indicate if there's someone in particular that you're addressing your question to. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for, and if we miss any of them, we'll send it out in a post-event email with missed q and A. Now let me tell you about our program today. Active Communities is a grant program intended to increase the availability of physical activity opportunities in BC communities through improved access and inclusivity, healthy community design, and healthy public policy. There are over 50 active community projects taking place across BC. These projects are part of BC's physical activity strategy. For those of you that aren't aware, BC's physical activity strategy is a fantastic initiative established by the Ministry of Health, but with loads of input and collaboration with many leading thinkers and NGOs in physical activity. BC Alliance for Healthy Living provides oversight and support for the programs that are target, targeted to increase activity in children and youth, which includes the active communities projects that we're going to talk about today. So through co conversation with project leads and, and in the early report, several topics have emerged that we think would be of interest to you today. So presenters from our projects across BC will share information about their projects with a focus on lessons around the following themes. We'll start out with multi-sectoral collaboration, understanding that that's the ideal that we're all striving towards, but it's often difficult to get participants to the table and to keep them there and involved in a meaningful way. And how, so we'll talk about how, how some of our projects have done that and, and what they see as, as some of the best ways to continue that work. Our second theme that we'll be speaking about is sharing lessons around key success factors and overcoming challenges, particularly as it relates to working in rural and small communities and working effectively with local governments. So we're hoping that these brief presentations will serve as a jumping off point for online comments and in chat box discussions from participants. We'll hear from the following projects and presenters across BC. Shawning Jennings will speak about the Bowen Island uh, Bike Park. Karen Mores will speak about the Indigenous Circle of Health. We've got Mariah Robinson from the Mid-Island Aboriginal Recreation and Culture Initiative. Uh, pardon me, Rebecca Tallman, who's going to speak about the Quadacha Roller Derby, and then Joanne Allard from ACAM Community Recreation Project. 
So that's a little overview of the webinar, but before our first speaker gets started, we'd like to start with a question about you. We'll put up this as a poll and post the results. If you see that you fit into one, more than one category, then just choose the one that's the best fit as to why you're joining today. So which of these statements best describes your interest in the webinar today? Please choose one. You either work or are interested in physical activity, in health promotion, you work at the community level or at the local government level, or none of the above, but it just interests you. All right, okay, so we've got a mix, a lot of people working in health promotion, quite a few folks in local government, and then um, some other people from community and, and that are working in physical activity specifically. Well, that's fantastic. Well, I think we'll have lots, lots for you to take away uh, from this today. So now I'll introduce our first two speakers. We've, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Shauna Jennings and Karen Mores. They'll be speaking to you about their projects with a focus on the theme of multi-stakeholder uh, collaboration. So Shauna Jennings is the Manager of Recreation and Community Services with Bowen Island Municipality, and she's the lead for the Bowen Island Bike Park. Then we've got Karen Morris, is from the Shimshian uh, First Nation, uh, Lakwalam. Uh, she's currently the Indigenous a recreation lead for the Township of Langley's Art, Culture, and Community Initiatives Division. And this position led her to being in charge of a pilot project called Indigenous Circle of Health. So let's uh, start with Shauna. Over to you. Thanks, Brenda. Uh, and welcome, everybody. Good morning. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, as Brenda said, my name is Shauna Jennings. I'm the manager of uh, recreation and community services for the Bowen Island Municipality. And I'm here to talk about our Bowen Island Bike Park project. Uh, next slide, please, Brenda. So I'll just be, oh, do want, there we go. Uh, looking at a few things this morning about our project, identifying how we identified some community needs and what we learned and how we went about addressing those needs. We'll also be talking about the multi-sector partnerships, uh, working with local governments, and some of our key learnings and how we've been able to build community capacity, and just the importance of celebrating success with these projects. And next slide. So Bowen Island, uh, we had a few things going on that helped us identify some of the community needs that led us to our uh, bike park project. Um, first of all, a survey for our community recreation plan in 2014, and a lot of the data that came out of that indicated a bike park was high on the list of improvements needed for um, active parks on Bowen. We also had the Early Childhood Development Instrument uh, was conducted in our public school system in 2015 and indicated that children on Bowen Island showed some vulnerabilities in social competence, emotional maturity, and communication skills. And I'll talk about that a little bit more and how it relates to the bike park in the next one. Next slide. Um, formal formation of a Bowen bike park group in 2016. I was a group of dedicated uh, parents and community members with multi-age children and they shared a common vision of a bike park on Bowen. So they came together and talked about how they could make that happen, approached uh, the local council and staff, and um, we'll talk a little bit more about that as a collaborative, uh, collaborative community initiative. Uh, also, we got some further support with our Parks Plan um, survey data that was completed in 2017, and the youth engagement around that um, really clearly supported the desire for a bike park on Bowen. And next slide. So just uh, to give a little bit of context around um, some of the community challenges that we have found um, for Bowen Island. and. One of those is a lack of direct access to a variety of recreation facilities. So um, Bowen lacks purpose-built outdoor spaces, and um, we do have a couple of playgrounds on the island, but um, really came clear that the community needed some places to gather, socialize, 
um, learn skills and connect and be physically active together. Um, Off-island excursions, we only really could access things like bike parks or skate parks um, by going off-island and that creates a time and financial commitment for families. Um, limited opportunities to meet new people and in the built environment, encouraging social connections. So we wanted to take a look at um, providing more opportunities for bumping places where people would be able to bump into people, meet, um, connect with their connect with their community. And also looking at um, just difficult terrain and unsafe roads for riding bikes and walking and that was limiting people's ability to participate in our active transportation initiatives. Uh, so we wanted to encourage that in as safe a way as possible. And what we were finding is that basic skills like riding bikes was not really something that all of the kids on the island were learning to do. Next slide please, Brenda. So what we learned, um, just picking out a few key points, the, um, through the surveys and the early development instrument in 2015, it really indicated that Bowen Island um, had limited outdoor play spaces and outdoor recreation programming for young children, where children had the opportunity to play with others and learn new skills. And this was having an effect on the social communication skills of our young children as well as contributing to isolation and reported feelings of loneliness among parents. Uh, through the youth engagement, we were also uh, learning that Bike Park was high on their list of um, things that they would like to be able to do on island and realized that many of them were building trails in the woods, but there were barriers to that as well as obstacles around appropriate land use. Uh, so we thought um, having a actual purpose-built space would be something to address some of those needs. So next slide please, Brenda. So we looked at the ad addressing all of these needs and with the formation of the bike park group, uh, it turned out the bike park project really made sense to um, look at quite a few of these needs. Creating an on-island amenity, it's multiple ages and abilities with skill progressions. So here you can see one of our riders on one of the jumps on the black diamond or the advanced track, part of our pump track. Um, the park serves as a, as a bumping space for people to connect and gather with friends and neighbors. Uh, in some of my um, research talking with people as I was preparing for this presentation, I've um, people have really enjoyed the fact that it's in the forest and uh, lots of really hot summer days were actually spent there as a, as a cooler way to be active and meet up with friends. Um, it provides a spot for more recreation programming and the recreation uh, community recreation department supports bike skill acquisition, building confidence in our riders. And we've seen an increase in the number of children biking to school, which links into our um, active transportation initiatives for the island that also were identified in our transportation master plan. And we've provided opportunities for youth to ride, but also gain work and mentorship experience within their own community. So next slide, please. There's some of our little people on the, the novice track of the pump track. And next one. And just a variety of ages uh, getting ready to ride there. And the next slide. So this just shows we've got um, four sort of sections. There's two green novice areas there, a blue intermediate track and a black advanced track. And that's just some of our signage that's there at the park indicating indicating which tracks are, are uh, what their skill levels are for each of these tracks. And next slide. Youth mentors, we were able to um, really connect with some of our island youth. This is probably one of my favorite parts of the project. Um, able to provide mentorship opportunities for these youth riders and they became ambassadors of the park. Um, these guys are all uh, skilled mountain bikers and very interested in the sport. And we um, provided some fundamental movement skills training for all of them. Uh, they were trained in pump track maintenance by the pump track builder, 
assisted in the grand opening and were there to teach kids about how to use the track and some skills, balance, uh, just how to get going around the pump track. Uh, they worked in pairs every Saturday and Sunday for the first three weeks that the park was open. So they were there to support bike park users, teach some skills, give tips, and help others learn the rules of the park. And when we talk about sustainability and building community capacity, this has been a really great way um, to build that community community capacity, create sustainability and training, and providing experience for these local youth. Uh, they are going to be involved in some future recreation programming at the bike park facility as well, and they will be helping out with ongoing maintenance. And next slide, please. And here they are with our bike park builder. They're just learning how to maintain the track. And the next one. And there's some one going off with one of our younger riders, <clears throat> giving them some skills and ideas and just creating some confidence there. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so multi-sector partnerships, this was a true multi-sector collaboration um, for Bowen. The Bowen Bike Park group was formed and they were um, a group of volunteers. I really can't say enough about uh, what they did for this project. Um, working tirelessly and bringing ideas, uh, working with municipal staff to bring the whole um, idea of a bike park to council. Uh, they organized community work parties to prep the site, worked with the builder, local contractors to get materials, labor, machines, and either some of some of which were donated or discounted. Uh, they fundraised over twenty thousand dollars locally and promoted the project and assisted with our grand opening. Um, Bowen Island Municipality, part of the multi-sector, the park is built on municipally owned land and is maintained now by BIM. Uh, Bowen Island Municipality also has a partnership agreement with Vancouver Coastal Health since 2015 and the funding for this bike park initiative through the Active Communities Grant really demonstrates how that partnership helped to develop and enhance supportive social and physical environments in our community. Uh, oh, I'll just get you to slip back, Brenda, to that last. Thanks. That's great. Um, community recreation and the youth center. So as we've just spoken about the mentorship opportunities for youth, uh, community recreation has been offering bike programs for young riders for years on Bowen. But and this fall, we were able to um, run our first program on the pump track. Uh, also, Metro Vancouver Parks was part of our partnership. Uh, for this project, the land uh, is adjacent to Metro Vancouver land in Crippen Park here on Bowen. So we worked closely with representatives from Metro Vancouver um, just to ensure environmental conditions were taken into consideration during the site selection, as well as the building and access to the bike park. And Metro Vancouver helped support our project um, changing signage on existing Crippen Park trails um, so that we could access the bike park um, by allowing bikes on those trails. And the school district, uh, school district 45, the bike park is located right behind the community school here on Bowen. And we've worked with uh, the school with their bike to school week initiatives and part of the community goal to increase active transportation. And uh, with the bike park opening last April, there's been a marked increase in students um, who are biking to school. Uh, next slide, please. That's great, um, Karen. Work, work, working with local government, um, so Bowen Island Municipality has a collaborative project service agreement and policy. The goal of that policy is to enable and support small community-driven initiatives and provide municipal staff support to those initiatives. Um, encourage the community collaborations and look at what the overall benefits to community residents are. Uh, the policy establishes an application and review process for all proposals that are brought forward to council by staff and community delegations. And that's a way to um, tap into our creativeness and enthusiasm of uh, existing in our community. And uh, the policy helps garner interest create a process to encourage the community collaboration. So that is the agreement that um, these community initiatives are supported by through the municipality. 
Uh, next slide, please. So some of our key learnings, um, having that local government and community group and supporters all working together, this was truly a multi-sectoral collaboration. It would not have happened if everyone had not been involved. And I think that's really a key piece of, especially in smaller communities, uh, there's an avenue for collaboration and a willingness to work together and driving forward some of these initiatives. Social benefits to the park, um, creating places to gather and create social connections is important and I believe needs to be really prioritized in our communities. Uh, especially in these times, we're seeing a lot of isolation and loneliness and um, at epidemic proportions. So just creating spaces where mental, mental, physical and emotional health can be affected by socially connecting with others. Uh, another, just looking into your future opportunities with the built environment, recreation programming. Um, the park is open uh, in all daylight hours, basically from April till October. I'm listening to the rain on my skylight, thinking we might need to start thinking about closing it. Um, but uh, we will also be able to provide some recreation programming there. Um, We've been able to increase community capacity, training some of the youth and um, being able to provide mentorship and experience for them as well. Uh, just being aware of ongoing maintenance of um, things with your projects, planning ahead, adequate budget is important and um, just be being prepared to, uh, to know what that's gonna look like. Now we've been through our first summer with the bike park and we'll have a better idea of uh, what that'll entail going forward. Project management, as with any project, um, I guess the key learnings for us was to be prepared and have contingencies. Um, we did have to come up with some plan Bs around uh, weather and timing of the building of the, of the park, as well as availability of materials and the builder, um, and aligning fundraising efforts with the timing of everything. And believing it's possible, that was a big thing um, for us, just overcoming any local stereotypes or challenges, but when everyone's working together, it is possible to make these things happen. Uh, next slide, please. Celebrating success, I think that's also really important with these projects is to really celebrate together. We had over 200 people come out to our grand opening event back in April, beautiful day with barbecue. Um, and everyone was really excited to ride what they had been watching get built for the previous five weeks. Uh, the big thing I think for me at that event was just seeing the multi-age features of the park really made it an event for the whole community. And you've got 15 year olds beside, with their full suspension mountain bikes uh, riding alongside three year olds on their run bikes. And um, it was just a really remarkable experience. A lot of the adults did give the park a go as well, but only after the audience had gotten a little smaller. Uh, so next slide, please. So there's a few of our youth mentors ready to go with the uh, ribbon cutting. And that's our donor recognition sign that's up at the park. Uh, lots of um, local donors as well as the um, Grant, Active Communities Grant. And next slide, please. That's a video, Brenda, if that, that will just give an idea what the park looks like. The park's located on 1,600 square meters. Looks like that's a bit jerky. So we That's could just slip. just fantastic, Shauna. Thank you so much for that uh, wonderful uh, overview of, of your bike park. It just looks like a fantastic uh, community amenity that has been created with, uh, with many different partners. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having on. me. Yeah, now we're going to move on to Karen. Um, Karen, are you on the line? Are you ready to go now? Yes, I am. Okay, Karen. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yes. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm Karen Moraes. I'm Simpian, uh from Lakwalams. We did the Indigenous Circle of Health. I want to thank Tanis for putting the slideshow together for me because um, anyone that knows me knows I work six to seven days a week, um, all day. So I'm a busy person. Thank you, Tanis. 
Um, our Indigenous Circle of Health program was brought together by the Township of Langley, Fraser Health, and Lower Fraser Valley Aboriginal Society. So I actually hold two positions. I work full time with the Township of Langley as the Arts, Culture, and Community Initiatives Division um, as a rec leader. And I'm also the office coordinator for the Lower Fraser Valley Aboriginal Society uh, three days a week. So I do have my hand in quite a few things and have a lot of connections, which worked perfectly uh, for this grant we had received. Um, with this grant, we were able to pull together a lot more groups. Um, we had uh, iSpark come on board, and they did um, all the sports, archery, lacrosse, wrestling, soccer, which is the uh, red post you see in the middle there. Um, we had Kwantlen come on board, which did a nature walk with Fern Gabriel. The Métis Wachia Society I had come and do a social Sunday event that was held at one of our rec centers. Um, we had a tremendous uh, turnout from 50 to 75 people showed up for that. Um, we had Simpson artist Corey Moraes, which is the purple and blue um, posters you see there. He did uh, two form line classes and also did a drum making course. And um, those courses all sold out within an hour um, of opening the registration. We had no idea that um, the indigenous art was in such demand um, out here in the Langley area. Um, we also had Jessica Slater. Um, her poster's not up there, but she did a beading class for us. And we had uh, Shamaya Priya come on board to do a powwow pump class, which was like aerobics, but learning how to powwow again. She did that with adults in a separate class for children. Um, our, the uh, focus of our social Sundays that we did was to connect uh, elders and youth um, by getting them together for different events. One of them you see there is the Campbell Valley Barbecue in the park. Um, we had full registration, and then we had almost the same amount of people come to walk in. So being Native, you always over-prepare. So thank goodness we had enough food for everybody. Um, all these events were free. Um, they were supplied by a grant um, fund. So everything that we advertised was um, free to everybody, not just the Indigenous community, but um, the, pub the general public. Um, there were a few hiccups along the way, being that this was new. Um, I lost a programmer in the beginning of my um, program. So I not only became the uh, person in charge of all of these programs, but I became the programmer itself. So I had to create the posters, create the program, find the space, get the instructors um, on board. Once we had uh, kind of the flow happening with that, uh, everything went really smoothly. Um, I was very thrilled with the amount of people that attended all our classes. Um, it's been well received by um, the Indigenous community that that um, keeps asking when we're going to do this again. And I've explained as soon as we get the funding, um, we will be on board. Um, this was actually a really uh, fun project to take on. Um, that was uh, the poster there as our closing ceremony. We originally had an opening ceremony planned, um, but seeing how I didn't come on board until some of this stuff was already in place in January, um, they did not know the proper protocol for indigenous peoples and didn't approach the lands whom we were on, which was Kwantlen, KT, Semiamu, and um, Masqui. And um, we didn't want them to feel like an afterthought, so we did a closing celebration, which is why in the beginning some of our programs um, had a slow start because we lacked the promotion for it that was supposed to be with the opening ceremony. Uh, the closing ceremonies went well. Uh, that first slide you had seen was actually a photo taken of the uh, video that they did explaining the closing ceremony in our programs with, uh, I believe it was the Langley event. Um, once we had um, had the, the video of what it was we were doing and we had um, everything else in place, we had a program that was that was out and distributed and I was pushing it in social media on every site that I managed and having people share. Um, we ended up with a, a really fantastic response. Um, we are looking forward to actually um, trying to get this to uh, happen again. We are applying for funding through uh, the Township of Langley um, because we ended up um, with our drum making class alone. It filled up in less than an hour and we ended up with uh, 45 people on the wait list. So we know that there's a need here. Um, there's not a lot of these courses that we offer that are out there for free. Um, 
not only through the Township of Langley, but uh, community centers. So we were really excited that we were able to present this to the community um, as a pilot project. Um, I am hoping that it will um, come, come to fruition again um, the second time around when that happens. But um, again, um, I want to thank Tannis for these slides. <laughs> I, I honestly do work six to seven days a week, and um, I'm the mom of seven kids, so um, it it may come across that I'm constantly working. So um, I really think that it's important that we uh, introduce uh, the, the Township of Langley and the City of Langley to um, our Indigenous crafts, our activities. Um, I do a lot of uh, spokesperson talking on behalf of the Indigenous community when I can, explaining the need that is here and the fact that um, the culture is going to grow out here. Um, the Township of Langley is currently building a new museum and we know that the sky trains are eventually going to come out here and we already have a forefront of artists that are moving out to the valley so I'm very excited about um, not only how well this pilot project did but what we may have um, in the future for us um, we have a lot of things that are on the horizon that we want to plan in conjunction with a lot more different groups um, I'm pleased that with iSpark, I was able to work with Alana Cook, whom I know, um, Kwantlen, uh, the Métis Society, the Simpson uh, artist. Um, it was an amazing project to take on. Um, I made a lot of connections. I made even more connections once it was over, people that are willing to come on board with the next project. But um, I think these kind of programs in conjunction with um, other indigenous sponsors and groups and um, nonprofit groups is important because it's not so much about each individual group um, pushing their own programs but being able to collaborate into something that turned out as big as this did um, i'm very proud of the project um, again i'm hoping i'll be back here um, again with another project um, that will also be in collaboration with other groups but i do appreciate you asking me to be here um, I don't know if anyone has any questions. Um, this was a huge project, and um, I'm I'm very happy with the amount of people that I was able to connect with in um, different nations and um, nonprofits, and through the uh, Township of Langley as well. So I'm sorry. This is short and sweet. <laughs> if anybody has any questions, I'd appreciate it. Um, but that, that is my um, talk right now about the Indigenous Circle of Health. Well, great. Thank you so much, Karen. And, and thank you to, um, yeah, thank you for your leadership in bringing together all those, uh, all those partners. It sounds like it was um, very meaningful and uh, really engaging. So um, I'll just say it's interesting to hear from both of you, uh, Sean and Karen, how you've uh, successfully been able to bring navigate the challenge of bringing different partners together and 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 to work together to achieve something larger and we've heard that from uh, many of our other projects uh, in fact the majority of our project leads reported that the grant project helped establish or strengthen a partnership with a regional health authority or or First Nations Health Authority staff and that it helped to increase the degree which elected local government uh, officials, um, such as chief and council or mayor and council, supported the project. And nearly a quarter of our of our projects uh, developed a memorandum of understanding with partners. So that's a lot of uh, MOUs and a great deal of partnership building. Now I'd like to open up the the phones to other people that might have uh, questions for our first presenters. And I do have a couple that are. Um, all, that have already started. So Janet Harris was interested in uh, in how you, uh, which engineering firm you used to design the park, and and how you handled uh, dogs on the trail. <laughs> um, so there is a sign in terms of the dogs. Um, we are discouraging having dogs on the bike park, um, and part of that is really because they chair they their feet will chew up the um the the dirt the the track as well as for safety um 
So it's just a bit of an education. We've got signs up asking that dogs are um, outside the fence. The whole park it has a split rail um, fence around it, um, other than where you can enter and exit. Um, but we do ask that dogs are not running around on the track, or people actually, um, shoes running around on the track are, are, uh, are not good for it either. Um, and we used um, Golden Dirt Trails was our designer and builder of the pump track. Great, thank you. Now I have a question for uh, Karen. 45 people on the wait list for your, for your drum making workshop, as you said, that shows a real need. How are you planning to approach the township of Langley for funding? Any tips on approaching local government? We've, occur we've currently applied for a few grants right now um, that we're waiting to hear back on um, in order to have like more of the indigenous programs. The beating was well received, the form line and the drum making. Um, we realized the biggest problem why most community centers don't do the drum making course is that the materials are so expensive. And there's only one source to uh, purchase here and that's downtown Vancouver. So in order to have you know a course like that, um, if you're paying out of pocket, not including the instructor fees, just the materials alone run $100 a person. So that's pretty high, you know, for somebody who wants to come in and learn to do a drum for three to four hours, um, not including the instructor fees. So we're hoping to get a grant, grant money that could either partially or pay for the full amount again, and hopefully for more people. Um, it, was, it was a really great course. Um, we have made some fa fantastic 15-inch um, drums. Um, it was actually taught by my husband, uh, Cynthia artist, Corey Mori, who's um, been a high-end artist for 22 years, and he's always wanting to give back to the community, so we're able to get him on board for a fraction of what he would normally charge um, to teach the courses. Um, he not only teaches drum-making courses with the Count of the Langley through my grant, but he also teaches um, with the Lower Fraser Valley Aboriginal Society and Yasmi. So he's been wanting to give back for some time and, and having this opportunity with these courses come up um, was um, very fulfilling for him. That's fantastic, that's great. Great to engage the, the culture and the physical as well. Um, I have another question for Shauna, um, and that was how did you organize the bike park groups? Did you oversee it or was it self-organizing? Uh, were there uh, parent champions who ran it, and how did you find them? Uh, there definitely were parent champions who ran it, and um, not so much uh, did we oversee it, but um, they kind of organized themselves um, as a group of um, interested community members who wanted to um, help make this happen and came and approached staff um, to find out how to go through the process of approaching council. Uh, so staff, municipal staff um, supported them. So that was, um, I was the staff liaison there and, uh, and wrote reports to council and kind of brought that forward um, uh, as the staff person. But they, the Bike Park Group really were a group of volunteers who came together and had an idea and really went out and made it happen. That's great. And one thing that I'll note is that both of your projects really had a, a strong uh, impact on, on social connections. And, and so what we saw with the, um, with the Bike Park is, is really getting the youth together and, and engaging those youth leaders and, and creating a, a bit of a, an intergenerational um, project. And then with the Indigenous Circle of Health, there was this great uh, connection between um, elders and youth through your social Sundays. So it's, it's lovely to have something that um, may seem like a, a physical activity initiative, but that's really uh, working to promote other aspects of health. So thank you both for the work you do. And stay on the line. We'll, we'll keep you on the line in case we have some more questions afterwards. But now we're going to turn it on to our next presenters. Um, so I'll just uh, introduce uh, them now. So we've got, um, uh, although I'll, I'll just note that we do have a note from Joanne Large that she wasn't able to join us today. 
So let's uh, turn it over to Mariah Robinson and Rebecca Tallman now. Um, they'll be speaking about uh, their projects with a focus on the theme of sharing lessons, success factors, and overcoming challenges in rural and small communities, as well as working with local government. So Mariah Robinson is the Cultural and Physical Literacy Coordinator with Nanaimo Aboriginal Centre, and she's the lead for the Mid-Island Aboriginal Recreation and Culture Initiative. Rebecca Tallman is a school counsellor at, and pardon me if I'm saying this wrong, at Atse Davy School, located on the traditional territory of the Quidditch Nation more commonly known as Fort Ware, BC. She is also the lead for the Quadacha Roller Derby project in Northern Health. So why don't we start with you, Mariah? Welcome. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Rita. Thank you, Brenda and Tanis. Um, yeah, I'm here to talk about the Mid-Island Aboriginal Recreation and Culture and what we uh, engaged ourselves in over the past 12 months and with the Active Communities Grant. Um, so yeah, you can start in there, Brenda, next slide. So what our project focused on was a uh, pretty large scale here. Our, we prepared canoe families for the 2018 tribal journeys where we went to Puyallup, Washington, which is a 250K paddle from Nanaimo. And we enhanced physical activity and healthy living. We wanted to focus on encouraging nutritional habits and positive nutritional habits. And we wanted to look at the notion of marrying culture and physical activity together, and not only focusing on physical literacy and getting our community um, active, but how do we as Aboriginals marry the two together to create that cultural connectiveness as well as cultural competency in all community, not just for Aboriginals to be more engaged in culture, but for non-Aboriginals to experience culture and learn more about our cultures on Vancouver Island. We also wanted to provide social and peer support for accessibility and inclusion and looking at the barriers that we had, um, that our families had, and that our, is that better? <clears throat> that our families and children had for accessibility and inclusion to the communities in Nanaimo and the other recreational facilities, or what programs can we do that was stronger for, um, that was just more accessible for our families. And then we had social media platforms that promoted physical activity and health and wellness. And just whether it's through snippets or through the photos that we had in our programs, but we wanted to just kind of create another form of communication. And lastly, we wanted to train our frontline staff around the active life license requirements about why it's important for us to be active and how many t minutes a day should we be active, as well as training frontline staff in culture so that our children and family um, were more than just a stat. In, our, in these programs, that there is also relationship building. So you can go to the next slide, Brenda. And so we originally were called Energizing Body, Mind, and Spirit. And so we wanted to find something that worked um, to encapsulate more of what we were doing and build this Aboriginal touch to it. So we changed our name from Energizing Body, Mind, and Spirit to Mid-Island Art that was going to be Aboriginal Recreation and Culture. And so we worked along the side of a local Snanamuk artist, Noel Brown, and we wanted to create this cyclical process of um, like the medicine wheel with the four directions, the four colors, and four strong animals that, um, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, sorry, I was just seeing some. Um, so yeah, so these four, what? I meant to send that to someone else, sorry. Oh, okay, yeah. So um, so then these animals represent in the Northwest Coast cultures a similarity or these symbolic um, positive values. So like the, the wolf represents community, they travel in packs, they're resilient in unity. The eagles, you know, there are um, guardians in the sky and carry our prayers to the creator. Uh, the bear who has so much power and love 
but that self-care to take back and hibernate and to come back and replenish their spirits when they're out of hibernation and the whale that you know when our loved ones pass on that they take our spirits um to the spirit world so we wanted to really create an iconic symbol that our families or someone can represent um just resemble with and identify themselves with so you can go to the next slide <clears throat> And so I wanted to touch base just on our project challenges, and you can go further again, Brenda, that going back to the initial scale of our collaborative model starting this project, as you could see all the different partners we had, um, all the different objectives that we had, and we wanted to target ourselves to go across all the way from baby up to our elderly and create those intergenerational relationships. So I just want to show you a funny um, next slide that was a insight into my brain this year is um, you can go to the next one, Brenda. <clears throat> that did it go to the next slide? Hello. Can you show that Brenda? you're on this slide with all the different connections from the different ages. Oh, okay, sorry, it didn't show on my screen, so I was wondering what was going on. Um, yeah, so like you could see an insight to my brain. I wasn't sure there were so many different objectives to have and what ages would be appropriate to serve to or what would we create, what partner would offer this or, and then there's arrows that can go the other way and who needed the training the most. And so it was just, we started doing all these programs around accessibility and we did horse riding, river rafting, we developed educational PE programs into our elementary schools, cultural programming into our high schools, into community in Lanceville that um, community members in Lanceville don't always have the means to travel into Nanaimo, which was like a 15, 20 minute drive to access programs. So we went and did some athletic programs on their end. Um, but then we started seeing there was a problem with this. So you can go to the next slide and that we understood that there was a huge community need in all these different areas. And thankfully we had tribal journeys in July where programming kind of completely slowed down. Well, we went on our two week paddle and it allowed us to have this reevaluation to prioritize and to figure out what is the most important in this moment that we can achieve that would create longevity for sustainability. And so you can go to the next slide because I'll touch on two of our hugest success factors um, that we can be proud of carrying on that could be sustainable without active communities funding. Um, carry forward. <clears throat> next slide, please, Brenda. Okay, so this one was um, building cultural competency. So going back to that training frontline staff module and the objectives we had around cultural connectedness, we wanted to develop this PowerPoint training um, presentation that was an introduction into Aboriginal culture on Vancouver Island. And we started talking with frontline staff about, do you know how many nations surround Nanaimo? Do you know how many First Nations there are in Vancouver Island? You know, do you know the difference between on reserve and off reserve? And we wanted frontline staff and our partners or general community to start seeing our youth more than just a stat, that they start having this understanding of where our youth are coming from. And we even tie into the First Nations Health Authority and the research around how many youth we are losing because of the lack of engagement and the lack of culture and the lack of acceptance. And um, the hard reality is that why it's important to have culture embedded into our programs so that we can have that long-term buy-in and that our youth want to return. So this really allowed our staff to have their own team bonding, they're experiencing culture, they're out on the land, and but they're also learning through us. And it was creating that stronger relationship that we're giving these staff a time where they can ask any questions they want without feeling that they're stepping on anyone's toes or that they're being, it's just a safe space to talk about culture and you know how to pronounce certain nations so that when they go and do land protocol that they're, 
that they feel confident themselves. Another one was our next slide, which is our another great one was our land and sea cultural program. And this, um, oh, you can see I spelled cultural wrong up there. Um, there, this one was a platform that we focused on youth. We had systematic change, and we created a partnership within the school district so that a lot of these programs align within school district and it's taking our youth out into the land and sea where they're learning authentic local Vancouver Island culture with the Nuchano, the Kwakwakiwak and Coast Salish. And our youth are fishing, they're hunting, they're shucking clams, um, cooking meals for community, harvesting cedar, weaving. And we worked with educators, master educators, around core competencies and the First Nations um, principles of learning so that us as programmers, we're speaking the same language for teachers so that the teachers can take this and create assignments around these programs. So when youth are engaged, they're coming back to the classroom, writing a paper or debriefing that is going to give them an education at the end. So they're not only learning about who they are as First Nations youth, but they're getting their education. It's aligning with the BC Ministry Education model. It's under the school districts, so the funding, it's becoming sustainable. We've looked for other avenues for funding, but we're really just out, we're engaged, we're culturally, physical, our mental, emotional parents have come to us and spoke about the gentleman that just went on their five-day hunting trip that their spirits are alive that their youth spoke about not being lost as a young team but now feeling like they have a purpose because somebody is taking them out and doing physical activity with them in a, in a meaningful way about who they are and connecting to them and who their grandparents were or their parents are but that is those are our two huge really unique success factors out of this project and um, it was unfortunate that other areas did have to put on hold so that we had sustainability but these two um, we just wanted to really put a highlight on because we're really proud of them and that is kind of mid-island arc in the last year and we have a lot of other smaller initiatives that can be sustainable on a smaller scale and we're looking at more funding to put more focus on those other areas because these two areas are going to carry on in the future after this, after Wednesday. So, but yeah, thank you. That is about Mid Island Arc. And if you have any questions, just send them my way and I can do my best to answer them for you. Well, thank you, Mariah. And what, and what an uplifting note to end there. This is alive and they have a sense of purpose. It's that's, that's just a beautiful outcome. Um, now I'd like to uh, introduce Rebecca, and she's also going to talk about <laughs> lifting spirits in, in a, or, or certainly certainly lifting up power. <laughs> so Rebecca, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, as was mentioned, my name is Rebecca. I am the school counselor at CDAV School. You did an excellent job pronouncing it um, in Fort Ware, BC. Um, so we are a very northern and remote community, and I'm going to be talking a lot about some of the challenges we face in our program and also our success factors as well. Uh, next slide, please. So just a little background on our project. Our project came to life after several years of dreaming, um, and so we're super grateful to the Active Communities Grant because it made our dreams come true. Um, so with the grant, we were able to establish a roller derby program for girls from grades 8 to 12. Um, and the biggest piece was being able to purchase equipment. So roller derby is a full contact sport. It requires the proper safety equipment. And so with the money, we were able to purchase enough gear to outfit 15 girls with all the equipment necessary um, and we were able to provide a program once per week throughout the school year. I have played roller derby for the past five years and I've been able to see the transformative power of a female-led sport um, that focuses on body positivity and female empowerment 
and being able to bring it to our youth has been so important. So we do have a shortage of youth programming in our community. Um, and in addition to that, we have nothing specifically for girls. Most of our programming is co-ed. So roller derby was something that the girls were able to take ownership over. It was something specifically for them, which was really important. And I wanted to bring this type of program to our community because it's so important to empower our young women. As a school counselor, I work with many of these girls. I witness their struggles. I witness their, the adverse experiences they've had growing up. So being able to give them something positive that not only included physical activity, um, but also included a piece around mental wellness and healthy coping strategies was really important. And we were able to do that by establishing this program. We created a safe space for girls to play sports, um, to build community and to um, empower themselves, which was really fantastic. Next slide. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, so this didn't come without challenges. We are one of the most northern and remote communities in British Columbia. I'm definitely sitting here very envious of all the other projects and how many resources and how many um, neighboring communities and um, other sectors are available to you. Um, we're pretty limited here and so we don't have a lot of other resources to rely on. So one of the challenges we had was definitely attendance. Um, the closest neighboring community to us is 70 kilometers south on the logging road. We don't have a lot of other communities we can draw on for attendance. Um, so we're kind of, whoever shows up is who we have. Um, our school is quite small. Our community is quite small. So getting a number of participants out was difficult, especially when roller derby requires a minimum of eight participants in order to really teach the sport properly. Um, so we noticed we had some challenges with getting consistent attendance and then keeping girls and that became a challenge and this is also because many of our older students um, take on a lot of responsibility at home and are often the heads of households so it became difficult to find a time where we could get everybody out um, at the same time and i'll talk a little bit more about how we address this we were able to open our intake this year um, to increase the number of girls coming out but the other thing we've done is we've never turned anyone away. So whether you come to every practice or you come to practice once a month or you come to practice once per season, we never tell someone they can't come and skate because maybe that's exactly what they need is to just turn their brain off, get some physical activity and skate for a couple of hours. Um, so no one is turned away in our program. Uh, the other challenge we face, of course, because of our location is just access to resources. Um, it, was difficult to collaborate with other communities or other agencies because of this. Um, but I was fortunate to receive a lot of support uh, from the school and from the band to run this program. Um, it was also difficult to get gear. Um, it's not like we can just go to the skate shop down the road and get the gear we need for these girls. Sometimes it takes up to six weeks to get the proper gear shipped to the community. And if we have any breakdown in our gear, it's not like we can just go to the store and fix it. Um, so that is another barrier we're facing as well. We can't just replace our wheels or our bearings overnight. Um, and space is also another big piece. So we're definitely fortunate that we have a school gym, um, but it is a difficult space because it's quite small to teach the girls how to skate. Um, we don't have enough space for a traditional roller derby track, so we kind of have to improvise. Um, but one of our goals this coming season is to take the girls to Prince George, which is about an eight to 10 hour drive. Um, so they can go to the roller dome and see a real roller derby track and get to skate in that space. So that's something we'll be working on as we move forward as well. Uh, next slide. Um, so we're now in our second season of roller derby in Quadacha, um, and we're constantly celebrating the successes of our program. Um, we have grown our program this year, so we increased our intake to include girls from grades 5 to 12. And we currently have 20 girls on our roster, and we have about 12 to 15 girls participating every Monday. Um, which is fantastic. We're finally at a stage where we can start teaching roller derby. Um, we, last year we focused mostly on just basic skating skills and now the girls are getting to learn the sport, which is super exciting. Um, and we've also been able to order more gear. So we now have enough gear to outfit 20 girls as well. 
And one of the biggest successes of our program is not only providing the girls with physical activity, but giving some sense of mental wellness and conflict resolution as well in our program. So I could probably talk to you about this for another hour, but I'll just highlight some of the um, things that we've seen successful. Mm -hmm. So because roller derby is about, um, about female empowerment and body positivity, the girls are learning a lot about consent and the power and control that they have over their own body. Um, and they're learning how strong and how capable they are. And these are really important lessons because we have such high rates of sexual abuse and sexual assault in our community. So giving girls that power and teaching them about consent through the sport of roller derby has been really important. Another big lesson for the girls is every practice we start saying, what is roller derby all about? And the girls will tell you that roller derby is all about falling down and getting back up because falling down is inevitable in roller derby, it's going to happen. Um, but it's how you choose to get back up. And that's been an important translation for their lives as well. Everybody's going to get knocked down, but how are you going to get back up? And we also do a checkout at the end of every practice. So we sit in a circle and the girls can share about their practice. Um, and that's been an important tool for team building. And we use it as a way to deal with conflict um, on the track as well. So that's been really important. And it's been incredible to see the girls grow together as well. Uh, next slide. Um, so as we move forward into our next season, we have plans to continue growing our program. Roller Derby Fever has definitely hit Fort Ware. Uh, we have a lot of kids interested as young as eight years old, and the boys are starting to gain interest as well. So it's my hope that we continue to grow as a program. Um, this year, uh, specifically, we'll be hosting a boot camp, so we'll be bringing in two players from the Vancouver Murder Roller Derby League to teach the kids new skills, and we plan to travel to Prince George to take the kids to the Roller Dome. Um, and of course, one of the most exciting parts of Roller Derby is choosing your Roller Derby name and persona. So some of the girls have done that already, but this year we'll be kind of formalizing that and they'll be getting their own jerseys as well. Um, so we're really excited to see where this next season takes us um, as we continue to grow. Um, and eventually, one day we'll be playing games, which is really exciting too. So we're hoping to align with the Junior Roller Derby League in Prince George and uh, create some opportunities for the girls to actually play some roller derby games, which will be awesome. Uh, next slide. Um, so I just want to end by saying a huge thank you, Messi Cho, to our supporters. First and foremost, uh, the grant that came through Active Communities has totally made this project possible. Um, Nerd Roller Skates is a locally owned shop out of Calgary that has been phenomenal in helping address our needs as a remote community and getting us the gear we need. And the Vancouver Murder has been a roller derby league supporting us. Um, and helping us develop our program. And they provided a lot of consultation to me as a coach. Um, as I mentioned, I skated for five years, but being a coach is a different role. And so they've been a huge supporter. And more specifically, um, two skaters, Mr. Testosterone and Mrs. Testosterone, who live in Prince George, um, have been helping me quite a bit. Um, so I just want to say thank you. And I look forward to hearing your questions. And thank you to the organizers of the webinar. It's been Really awesome to see all the other projects. So well, thank you, Rebecca. That's incredible. I just love to hear about the the power and resilience that you're creating in in these girls. What what a fantastic uh, initiative, and um, and. As I said before, Mariah, so um, inspiring to hear about spirits coming alive and, and your youth having that sense of purpose. And, you know, this really illustrates how both of your projects have really been able to, to, to navigate some of those challenges and barriers of rural or smaller communities and, and, and find some really uh, creative ways around and, and to tr uh, look at assets and, and building up some assets within, within the communities. Um, I'd like to open up the, the line to, uh, to questions now. Um, and I do have um, uh, one here from Lori. It says, interesting policy to never turn anyone away in your program. 
and uh, and did that create help to create an inclusive environment, a built-in understanding to uh, participants' situations? Rebecca, did did you um, uh, did you want to answer that one? Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. We really have like. With most of our programming up here, like we never turn kids away, um, and and it is it is about creating inclusivity. It's so important. Like I said, some of these girls have younger siblings they're caring for. They are in charge of their home. They are doing so much. So to say no, you can't come because you haven't been to practice is unfair. When I know the situation that they're in at home. That's why sometimes it helps being the school counselor and running this program because I'm more aware of the environmental factors. So it's definitely created some inclusivity. Um, and the girls love having anyone, right? They're not, they're not getting mad or getting annoyed with people showing up that haven't been there. They're happy to skate no matter what. Um, and so it's been a really great way for them to include their peers as well. Yeah, and I'll just say, I'll just add to that, Rebecca, that uh, we've done some research around inclusion, accessibility, um, uh, around physical activity, and that was certainly a, a best practice that we've seen. Uh, and it comes out in literature, and it comes out in, in interviews of, of, of um, leaders that uh, when you make it, the more open you make it, the more welcoming the more people will, will continue to gauge even those even those participants from marginalized communities. So there is something to be said for having an open door. It really does create that welcoming open space and, and people seem to respond to that. So that's uh, fantastic. I, um, I have a question here um, uh, for Mariah. And um, how were you able to build the training module for your frontline staff? I mean, that, that was a really important piece, and, and I think that's uh, going to add to the, to the sustainability of this initiative in terms of having that as, as a culture. Uh, that's just my little editorial in there. Um, but the, the question goes on to ask, are you willing to share your, your training or, or uh, your training tips or your approach? Yeah, I um, so the PowerPoint was established on just a um, geographical makeup um, so that you could see it's all public knowledge that we just compiled together and by myself facilitating it from a Kwakwaka'wakw perspective. And I touch on this um, Coast Salish and New Channels uh, with all respect, but with um, around what are our similarities and differences. And we have, like we've talked about that this is a webinar that can be done remotely because around Vancouver Island and and we kind of look at a provincial scale, but my knowledge isn't um, strong in a provincial scale of all the different nations we have. But when you and then we narrow it down into the Mid Island region to really focus on who our audience is on a census basis from the 2016 census and. Um, we have definitely had MCFD take it, Boys and Girls Club, VIU students. We've looked at uh, what does that look like for to approach the university for all first year students to take something like this um, as an introductory into post-secondary because we really feel that it's important, especially when there has been research on the morbid death rate of why culture is important and why it's important for frontline service workers to be engaged with their participants as well, not just for participant engagement. So um, yeah, I didn't have my email on the slide, but if you are interested in something and looking if there is a need for a webinar, I'm pretty sure we can do this remotely because so far it's just been our partners or organizations um, coming to us in Nanaimo and asking for us to offer this. You, you won't oh, get yeah. the cultural engagement piece afterwards, but people have, it's just those that have been in an IMO and we haven't even promoted it because I feel that this is a full-time job in itself because of the need for the training. So. Well, that's, that's just uh, great, Mariah. And I'll just note that um, I sparked the Indigenous Sport, Physical Activity, and Recreation Council. Part of their um, contribution to the physical activity strategy is also creating a cultural competency um, uh, uh, 
packages or a training as well. Um, and so that's also going to be uh, available uh, to others um, as uh, you know, when, once that has, been, it's right in the field right now. They're 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 testing it right now, and and um, that will be more widely available uh, to others going on. I have another question from Bryna um, for uh, Rebecca. Do you, uh, with the boys now being interested, do you envision keeping the program as a girls only uh, program? Um, I've definitely thought about that, and that is like a huge discussion within the roller derby world itself. So we have seen a rise in men's roller derby, um, but um, the community still maintains that it's a female sport first. And so if and when we decide to bring boys into the picture, I would give the, let the girls make that decision. What do they want for their program? Do we want to keep it separate? Do they, are they going to welcome boys into that space? Um, and address it that way. Yeah, that's great because that is a, a real strength of that roller derby is, is like you said, um, that female empowerment piece and and teaching girls uh, around the, you know giving them skills to build their own resilience and um, in a in a really uh, uh, female uh, empowered environment. And I think that's um, that's just fantastic in terms of building that resilience. Um, I'd like to open up the lines now to questions for all of our presenters. If you've got uh, other questions for some of the other presenters, um, please enter those in your, your chat box on the side there. I'll just give people a, a minute uh, to do that. I do have um, uh, another one for Mariah here. Um, it says, your slides were fantastic and especially powerful one was the map of your brain in the past 12 months. So many people on the line can relate. Can you speak a little bit more about how you were able to, to narrow the, the focus uh, on that? Um, yeah, certainly. Um, I think it just came down to I was one person um, doing this project, but I did develop a partnership with VIU and had students that wanted some cultural experiential learning to be engaged with Aboriginals and they came and helped and we had like a term project to offer um, accessible programming. And when it started coming down to an evaluation of the attendance, um, even um, long-term attendance and then it just became what was the most successful and and we continued throughout the start of the year wanted to be like okay what is sustainable right we always had that in the back of our minds of what is something that can be sustainable after and can have that meaningful um, buy-in and so when we narrowed the focus down it was just looking at um, how do we get it in schools? Because everything that we're doing is around this truth and reconciliation and, and moving forward collectively with non-Aboriginals and Aboriginals. And the most important is the education that our youth are getting. And so we thought even at Nanaimo Aboriginal Center's vision is all around the realization for 100% graduation rate in the Nanaimo ladies. So this educational objective really stuck out to us as well and that's why we chose the cultural competency and the land and sea where high school students are being culturally engaged and we even have an elementary school as well but we wanted to focus on two strong areas that we can do really good at and then focus on the other areas where we can improve because we didn't want to spin in as you've seen in my brain in the last year I didn't want to spend in 12 different ways and only do 20%. I wanted to do really well in two areas and then be able to focus on other areas afterwards. Well, it looks like you have done uh, very well in those two areas and um, and it's just fantastic to see that uh, that land and sea cultural program and in terms of uh, creating that, that, that sense of purpose and, and meaning um, and um, yeah, it's just it's just wonderful. 
Um, it seems right. Oh, I have another question here uh, for Shauna. Um, did you need to negotiate with any private landowners uh, when you were when you were uh, scoping out the Bowen Island bike park? Uh, no, we didn't. The um, the site for the bike park was chosen to be on municipal land, so we um, we just needed to discuss with council uh, that they would allow um, for the use of a bike park on that on that piece of land. Okay. But we did not have any um, private landowners. As I said, it does butt up against Metro Vancouver land and School District 45 on either side. So um, that was part of the the um, collaboration with those two um, partners. But um, yeah, the bike park is all on municipal land. Oh, that's that's great. Yeah, and so and. Um and and I I have to say it's just fantastic that it does butt up onto the school the school uh, land and that must create a little bit of extra profile uh, for the youth that you're trying to reach through that bike park. Would you would it you absolutely, say so? I would say so. Yeah, it absolutely does. And um, we've definitely seen a big increase in uh, kids biking to school and. Um, or bikes getting dropped off if it's a bit too far for them to cycle all the way. Um, and I've also spoken with the school principal who's had to um, put uh, some put some parameters on when the kids are allowed to go to the bike park. So, so it is being used. Um, yeah, and um, yeah, it's really it's a great uh, becomes a really great hub in our community. We don't have currently a community center. We are um, working on that as well here on Bowen, but uh, having the bike park, the school, the playground, the fields, um, and tennis court kind of all in one area is really creating a great hub for um, people to be able to connect and be physically active together all in one place. And, and one more question, Shauna. Um, somebody wanted to know about whether taxes uh, were raised to build the bike park or, or just around to, if you could speak to the municipal funding piece. Sure. Um, actually, the municipal funding piece was uh, negligible. It uh, was really more about um, staff support from the municipal side of things. Uh, we were able to, uh, with the Active Communities Grant as well as local fundraising, the Bike Park Group did a fantastic job of raising um, local funds and also they had applied for a few local grants available here on Bowen as well. And um, so municipally it was more just about providing the land and staff support uh, and the rest was all fundraised or grant um, grant money which was really great so no taxes taxes were not um, affected at all by by the bike park well that's great mm -hmm. Well, it looks like we've come to the end of all of our questions. So I'd just like to thank all of our speakers uh, for, for providing so much to think about in, in terms of your community-based projects and what's happening uh, in terms of uh, partnership and, and stakeholders. And um, you know, thank you so much for the work that you do in community. Obviously, you're really uh, making a difference in your communities and, and really providing some fantastic opportunities uh, for people to be physically active, at, but also socially connected and, and uh, I think uplifted as well. So um, I'd like to thank you for that. And I'd like to thank our audience as well for your attention and thoughtfulness and questions. We're so glad that you could join us today. We will be following up with a very short survey, so I hope that you'll respond to it as it, it helps us to learn from these events and understanding what's working and what we can do better next time. Uh, we also hope that you'll join us again on Tuesday, December 4th uh, at the same time, 9 o'clock to 10, uh, for our next webinar, which will take an in-depth look at the ages and stages of physical activity across the lifespan. We're going to profile two important programs appetite to play and choose to move, one which is based on the early years and one which is 
um, more for our seniors and elders. So please stay tuned for that webinar invitation coming soon. And thanks so much for enjoying us today. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, Brenda. Thank you, Brenda. And Rita. Thanks, Brenda. Thank you. Yep, thank you, Bye, everyone. everyone. Bye.